Welcome, everybody, to the Northern Electric Vehicle Experience podcast for Sunday, January 23rd, 2022. We've got lots of stuff to talk about in this show, and we have a little bit of a voice note from one of our listeners. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a potpourri day, as uh, Peter Mansbridge would say on his podcast. We're going to talk a little bit about different things, and uh, we'll see if we can catch each other up on what's going on in the in the wonderful world of EVs. Let's get right into it. Um, I don't know if my listeners are very aware, but China is quite big into the EV space. They probably are the largest electric vehicle market in the world. Uh, They make a ton of EVs and they import a ton of EVs. Here's an anecdote uh, that I heard not that long ago, which will give you an inclination of the difference between China and the rest of the world on EVs. An English uh, city announced that it was, a minor city announced that it was signaling its great success at putting a couple of EV buses on the road on this day. The very same day, a Chinese city converted its entire fleet of 10,000 buses to electric. The scale is somewhat different. I'm not a cheerleader for China, especially with uh, what's been going on between uh, China and Canada in the last while. But we do have to recognize that they are uh, moving right along with EVs in a, in a rapid way. It uh, doesn't mean we, we need to get left behind or are, have been left behind. It's still early days and we can catch up. But One of the concepts and one of the interesting companies uh, from China is a company called NIO. They make electric cars, but they have an interesting concept that has been uh, doing very well in China, and they're now trying to experiment with it outside of China. It's battery swapping technology. Literally, they sell you a car, they can sell you the battery, they can lease you the battery, um, and you will drive into one of their swap stations and i believe it's in less than a minute or in about a minute uh, maybe as much as three minutes but certainly not more than that they can take your uh, your battery out put a new battery in and boom off you go and furthermore you can also have say a smallish battery for your daily you know, whatever you do, and it's size, get one that's sized according to your daily whatever. Um, and then uh, maybe you're going to pull a, a trailer or you're going to go on a road trip or something like that. You can get a larger battery, a much larger battery, up to what your vehicle is capable of handling, which I think in NEOs goes up to about 100 kilowatt hours. And just have that for the period of time that you need it. And then uh, you reduce back to your more normal battery when you don't need it. This will allow. Uh, Something that needs to happen in EVs in that electric cars should be sized with batteries that are more appropriate to what people do with them um, on a daily basis, not for those onesies and twosies of times that you might take your vehicle on a road trip. Um, That's a lot of resources to to throw uh, into a, a gigantic battery that a lot of people will frankly almost never use. Uh, So this gives a potential swapping scenario that perhaps in the future, maybe you will charge at home as a normal thing, but maybe you won't own the battery in your car. Maybe you will lease the battery and you will most of the time lease an ordinary battery that suits your daily needs. And when you need a bigger battery, then you go to your battery swap station, your dealer, whatever, they put in a bigger battery. You lease that for a couple of weeks, a month, and off you go. Also, you could get, say you live and work in the same town, and you don't need a battery that's more than, say, 30 kilowatt hours for your average daily whatever you do. But then you get a job that's in the next city over, and now you need to be able to drive 45 minutes, you know, 100 kilometers, you know, 75 kilometers, 70 kilometers away. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to say, hey, my manufacturer, I want at least the uh, 75 kilowatt hour battery now instead of the 40 kilowatt hour battery. And you just go in, they swap you out, and you're good to go. Um, that sounds like an idea that might might have some legs. But NEO is expanding outside of China. 
And uh, they are expanding into Norway. A lot of you may not be aware, but Norway is a huge EV market. They sell more EVs than they sell gas cars uh, by far. Um, and I think they have a climate a lot like ours in Canada. They have a northern climate. And they just seem to be selling EVs like they're going out of style. They are actually the number one electric vehicle market in Europe. And they tend to get the the EVs uh, before anywhere else in Europe does. So that's an interesting uh, an interesting thing. They're a great test bed market, and that's uh, it's good to see. Uh, another thing that's coming up is Shell, the oil company, has announced that it is building and opening its first uh, what they call electric charging hub. They've taken an existing uh, gas station, uh, what they call a forecourt in England, and they've converted it to a an electric car charging station. It's kind of funky. It's got neat uh, uh, roof layouts. It's got a you know, ten chargers on each side, and a and a little convenience store snack bar thing at the end. Um, it's what a lot of people think uh, electric vehicle charging should come to in the long run. Apparently, they're uh, setting them up, I believe, with tritium uh, equipment, but uh, don't quote me on that. Shell Canada is also expanding its EV charging infrastructure. It has said it will be bringing in. Uh, electric vehicle charging to stations within Canada. I believe they said they were getting, uh, yeah, 3.95 million uh, in federal funding uh, to set up EV fast charging in up to five provinces. Now, I imagine they're throwing money into it too, because those federal grant programs generally require uh, kind of like a 50-50 split, a 60-40 split, or whatever, something to that effect. This will uh, result in 79 charging ports in 39 locations, according to the Electro Electric Autonomy, Autonomy Canada article uh, related to this. That is excellent. What else is going on? Uh, IV charging station network. That is, uh, an Ontario charging station network. And it is a collaboration between Ontario power generation and, um, uh, Ontario hydro, as I recall, uh, they have a smallish, but fast growing, uh, high quality network, uh, around the province of Ontario. They've paid a special attention to, to putting chargers in a strategic grid so that you're, you know, a certain distance away from all the chargers and they're making sure they get into some of those dead zones that are very problematic in Ontario. Uh, I've used their chargers many times. They're flawless. They tend to be the tritium charger or, or the Siemens tritium charger, uh, which is kind of uh, interesting. I find um, it's an excellent charger. The tritium equipment is is top notch. Uh, at first, they were all fifty kilowatt units, but apparently now they're going to be up to I think it's a hundred and four no hundred and fifty kilowatts. And at the en route stations, they will have up to one hundred and fifty kilowatts at those stations. It'll be thirty cents a minute. They're going in uh, starting this month. Uh, they'll go live in. Let's see, Napanee in January, Odessa January, Mallory Town, Mallory Town, uh, Trenton, all in January, February, another Trenton, Port Hope, uh, Dutton is in January, West Lorne is in January, Tilbur, Tilburn, Tilbury North and Tilbury South, also in January, Woodstock in January. Cambridge, north and south in February, in Phil in March. That's near me. That's good to see. King City is in the fall. It's, it seems to be the 400, cor ugh, 400 corridors getting a little bit uh, pushed back because Barrie and King City is not till the fall. Ingleside's in February of 2022. Morrisburg in February and Beansville in February. That is a lot of chargers going in and it and at the higher capacities. Obviously, we'd like to see a lot more, but uh, they don't seem to be slowing down at all. They're moving right along, uh, and that's specifically an Ontario network. 
and I'm glad to see that happening. Uh, the electric circuit and flow networks are excellent. Electric circuit in Quebec, flow in Canada. But uh, I, I'm glad to see a, an Ontario-centric uh, network uh, building out that is making sure our gapages get filled. What else we got on the go? The International Energy Agency released a report that said Canada needs to triple its uh, renewable energy generating capacity in order to meet their targets for electric vehicles and phasing out of, of fossil fuel power generation. I'm not going to argue with them too much. Um, clearly, we do need to increase our um, our renewable energy uh, production, but we're not talking huge in order to convert. Right now, 5% of our generation in Canada comes from coal, 11% comes from natural gas. The balance is some form of renewable energy, mostly hydro, uh, but also uh, some solar, some wind. And then, of course, in Ontario and a little bit uh, elsewhere, uh, a lot of nuclear power. So um, Canada is well on its way to getting to where it needs to be. Where I'm going to pick a bone with um, the International Energy Agency is they seem to be very fixated on an old world idea of, of how you generate power and produce power for uh, the grid. First of all, it, it thinks less in distributed energy terms. It, it doesn't incorporate a lot of new tech. It also doesn't seem to think that much about how those EVs will charge. And the vast majority of EVs are going to charge at night. And if you know anything about grids, they tend to be overpowered at night by a lot. Uh, there was a scandal here in um, in Canada not that long ago, in Ontario, about how we had had to pay New York to take our power. And that was a big scandal. People couldn't wrap their heads around it. It was a hue and a cry. And it never really came out very well why that happens. It seemed to be like everyone was saying it was a failure on the government's part. And this would have been in the win McGinty time before Ford. It hasn't come up since, but I'm sure it still goes on because a lot of people don't understand why uh, we would pay New York to take our power because it gets complicated. People don't like complications in news articles uh, in, uh, in, in the nightly news. And what it is, is when you have renewable power, wind and solar, uh, but moreover, if you have nuclear power, these are not things you can shut off regularly, uh, readily. So when you have a scenario where you're producing lots of power, but no one is there to consume it, then it has to go somewhere. You can work with your own grid to make sure that some high energy use uh, operations use that energy when it's available, you try to shift the grid around a little bit, but and you will do things like turn off your um, natural gas and coal-fired plants in order, and you'll stop the windmills from turning. You'll do that kind of thing, but you can't turn off a nuclear power plant that readily. It takes a long time to shut one down. It's not flicking a switch. It's many hours, if not days, to shut these things down. Um, it does not happen on the drop of a hat. Unless it's an emergency shutdown, then I think bad things happen. You can't have too much power in the grid. You have to put it out somewhere. So if you can't consume it locally, then you have to sell it to somebody else. If they don't want to pay for it, then you incentivize them to take it. And that's what was happening. What's now going to happen is with all these new electric cars coming into the market, we can have vehicle-to-grid bidirectional charging and usage. Um, if we play it out right, well, there's a couple things going to happen here. Ontario is a smart uh, grid. Uh, every home has a smart uh, a smart meter. Um, I actually participated in uh, in a pilot project here in uh, Barry with um, PowerStream. No, I don't call it PowerStream anymore. Uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. Where I would plug my car in and they would be able to control the level of charge. Uh, that was a testing process so that 
if the grid is being overburdened, uh, the grid could slow down the amount of charging that's happening to my car and, uh, and therefore lessen the stress on the grid. Imagine if every electric car in Canada or in Ontario all of a sudden decided to plug in at the exact same time. The grid needs to have the ability to, to slow that down, to, to reduce the amount of charging that's happening at any given time. Um, doesn't mean it needs to stop it all, but it just needs to just balance that out, sort of stagger it in so we don't like crash the grid or something terrible like that. What can also happen is uh, with vehicle to grid, as the grid requires more power, it can draw a little bit from your car. This would be more like a middle of the day. Um, industry is really uh, demanding a lot, maybe a high air conditioning day, whatever. And you could sign up for an agreement with your power uh, provider, your utility, your grid um, that says, hey, you can use up to a couple of percent of my battery if you need to and pay me for that. Um, uh, and then you can draw that out of my out of my battery. That is a lot of power if they sign up many, many, many vehicles, uh, like 10, 20, 30, 50 percent of the vehicles out there. It won't dramatically affect any vehicle out there uh, uh, and their ability to drive home or to work or here and there because they've decided, okay, I'll let you have up to a couple percent, 10 percent, whatever floats your boat. Um, you already know you can spare that and you're going to get paid for it. So you're, it's, you're going to be incentivized to, to participate and that will allow the grid to, to balance itself, to fluctuate with the demands, the peaks and the valleys and try to, you know, level that off to an even keel. So I don't think the International Energy Agency was taking that kind of thing into account, that sort of power shifting, uh, the nighttime charging effect of, of electric vehicles or the vehicle to grid component. Um, I don't think they were taking into effect uh, power energy storage systems, both in, in vehicles being a valuable asset to the grid, uh, in stabilizing the grid over time. Um, also, stationary power uh, batteries like the, the big power bank down in Australia or some of the ones they're building here in North America and Europe. What else is on the go? Ah, yes. Uh, one of our fellow podcasts, a, a fan of this podcast, and I'm a fan of theirs too, it is the uh, Northern EVs podcast uh, out of I think they're out of Manitoba, could be Saskatchewan, but I think it's Manitoba. And um, they got a nice little podcast. It's it's uh it's entertaining. They get some good guests on there, and they they also do some reviews sometimes. <laughs> they're exploring how to do a review on a on a car in when you can't see the thing. So I found that a little challenging too. When I'm doing a bit of a review, I want to sort of get tantalize you a little bit about what the car is, and then you're you know, you might say, hey, that might be for me. And then you'll go seek out a, a YouTube video review or something like that. So without a further ado, I'm going to play the voice note that they left for me. Hey, this is James with uh, True North EV podcast. I actually did drive the Ionic 5. Well, uh, I guess here in Winnipeg, Manitoba at uh, Focus Hyundai. And great little car. I have a Kona Electric, and the Ionic 5 was way better, way quieter, uh, way better traction. Uh, great vehicle for the price. It was the preferred rear-wheel drive. Uh, yeah, I did do a review on my podcast, True North EV. Uh, yeah, an awesome podcast. Quite enjoy it. Have a great day. That was True North EV's podcast. I invite you to check them out. They're a great little podcast. I enjoy it. It's uh, not weekly. It's a little irregular, uh, but uh, they tried, they, they've done quite a few, and I, I do enjoy them. What else can I tell you? Uh, that was an interesting review uh, that he did on the Ionic 5. It's just a little brief one. He had a more in-depth one in his uh, podcast. It's a great little car. It's starting to show 
some range issues that may be ironed out that the range isn't quite as much as people were hoping and that it suffers a bit in the winter. Uh, it's fast charging is still stunningly, uh, quick. Um, it, I've seen one in the wild. It's a beautiful car. Um, and I'm going to arrange for a test drive when things get a little bit more sane around here. Well, I think I've waffled on long enough for one week. Uh, I'm going to ask you again, please send me your, your, uh, your voice notes. Uh, let me know if you've seen a, an ID four in the wild. Now that we have the Ionic five here in Canada, um, what other interesting EVs do you see out there? If you have a car dealership in the Barrie area and you would like your EV reviewed on this podcast, please do uh, send me a message and I would love to take your vehicle out to review it. I expect that's not going to happen too much uh, until a bit more supply shows up into the market. But anyways, thank you for listening and we'll talk to you again in about a week.